Palmolive Soap, your beauty hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks manages to keep pretty busy teaching English at Madison High School. But in spite of her preoccupation with her own subject, she's managed to find quite a bit of time lately to pursue the study of biology. One thing is certain. I've spent more time pursuing the study of biology than the biology teacher has spent pursuing me. <laughs> it isn't that Mr. Boynton doesn't believe in romance. After all, if it weren't for him, Alice and Vincent, Mabel and Ted, and Bernice and Henry would never have gotten together. And everybody knows there's six of the happiest rabbits in town. <laughs> anyway, I was pretty surprised last week when my landlady, Mrs. Davis, told me that Mr. Boynton had borrowed my copy of Rostand's Cyrano de Bergerac from our library. We were discussing it last Thursday morning while Mrs. Davis was getting breakfast ready. I can't understand it, Connie. Cyrano is a very romantic play. Does Mr. Boynton read that kind of literature? I doubt it very much, although he surprised me once before this when I saw a book on his desk called Come Fly With Me. That sounds like a very racy novel. That's what I thought till I saw the rest of the title. That read The Life and Times of an African Tsetse Fly. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe now that the weather's getting nicer, he'll warm up a bit. Remember the old saying, in the spring, a young man's fancy. Not Mr. Boynton. He's no fancier in the spring than he is in the winter. <laughs> oh, that must be Walter Denton. I asked him to pick me up this morning. Coming. Oh, come in, Walter. Thanks, Miss Brooks. Come on into the dinette. I was about to have some breakfast. Will you join me? No, thanks, Miss Brooks. I couldn't eat a thing. Not the way I feel. What's the matter, Walter? Are you ill? Well, not physically. Mentally? No, not mentally either. I guess it's what you'd call spiritual mal de mer. <laughs> you know what they say, when love enters the heart, appetite flees the stomach. <laughs> Who says that? I don't know. I guess it's anonymous. It deserves to be. <laughs> Hello, Walter. Oh, how are you, Mrs. Davis? Fine, thanks. I'll set a place for you right here. Just sit down and we'll have a nice breakfast in a jiffy. Walter doesn't want anything to eat, Mrs. Davis. He's got spiritual mal de mer. Oh, that's too bad. But how about you, Connie? I've got a big bowl of wheat cake batter humming in the mixmaster. Or uh, would you rather have a fried egg? I'll just have some fruit juice and coffee, Mrs. Davis. If I don't watch my figure now, Mr. Boynton never will. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have my egg scrambled, Mrs. Davis. And just so you shouldn't waste the batter, you can give me a stack of wheats on the side. <laughs> All right, Walter. With maybe a couple of strips of bacon? Uh, let's see now. What was I talking about again? About love killing your appetite. Oh, yeah. I'm really worried, Miss Brooks. It's about Harriet Conklin. She's been very cool to me lately. Why? Have you been eating at her home, too? <laughs> no, it isn't that. It's just poetry she's been getting lately. Poetry? From whom? That's just the trouble. I don't know who from. You don't know from whom? I don't know from nothing. <laughs> Sending her love lyrics like mad. Here are your eggs, Walter. Oh, thanks, Mrs. Davis. Miss Brooks, I suspect that the sender of the notes works around the cafeteria. Why the cafeteria? Because that's where she receives most of them. Whoever's writing the poetry has been sneaking it into her desserts. How did you find that out? Well, I've been suspicious for over a week. So yesterday, while Harriet wasn't looking, I switched desserts with her. And sure enough, tucked right in the middle of my chocolate eclair, Omar Khayyam. <laughs> At least I think it was Omar Khayyam You mean you're not sure? Well, it was pretty gooey That's Omar Khayyam, all right <laughs> Here are the wheat cakes, Walter Oh, thanks, Mrs. Davis Oh, this thing has got me all at sea, Miss Brooks I can't sleep at night I can't study right I can't eat I know Here's the syrup, Walter Thanks <laughs> Some more butter, too, please Oh, sorry, here you are Listen, Walter, Harriet's just like any other adolescent She's intrigued with the idea of having a secret admirer. Receiving anonymous poetry is a very romantic thing for a young girl. Can you remember receiving any poetry, Miss Brooks? Back when you were young, I mean? <laughs> Just 
one, Walter. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow sent me the original copy of Evangeline. <laughs> Ah, uh, now you're kidding me, Miss Brooks. Uh, you must have been a baby when Longfellow was alive. <laughs> I was big for my age. <laughs> Look, Walter, there's only one thing to do. Beat this unknown rival of yours at his own game. You mean I should send her some anonymous poems and then after a while tell her it's been me all along? Exactly. Now, doesn't that make you feel better? It sure does. Oh, Mrs. Davis... Yes, Walter. On second thought, I think I will have some breakfast. What have you got in the house? <laughs> Just our cat, Minerva. You've eaten everything else. <laughs> and these are the main points of difference in the circulatory systems of cold and warm-blooded animals. Well, that'll be all for today. Excuse me, Mr. Boynton, but you asked me to wait after class. Oh, yes, Walter. About that note you were scribbling while you should have been listening to my lecture on the North American tree toad. Hand it over, please. But, Mr. Boynton, it's personal. I'm sorry, Walter. I've got to find out what it is that's so much more important to you than the North American tree toad. Well, all right, Mr. Boynton. But you won't learn much from this. Well, let's see. Oh, it's a poem. <clears throat> Tis but for you that my heart does beat, and over and over it does repeat... As it says your name, it twists like a lariat just because your name is Harriet. <laughs> well, Mr. Boynton, now you know. It's Harriet Conklin that's more important to me than a North American tree toad. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to embarrass you, Walter. I think our esteemed principal's daughter's a fine girl, and I'm quite fond of poetry myself. You, Mr. Boynton? Yes, me. There are things in my life besides toads, too. Really? What? <laughs> well, uh, 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 one of my favorite bits of verse is quite similar to the one you've written. It goes, Your name hangs in my heart like a bell's tongue, and evermore with love I tremble. And the bell swings, and then your name rings out. And everything you do lives in my heart. Well, Walter, what do you think of it? <laughs> it's pretty mushy, if you ask me. <laughs> Not at all, Walter. That's one of the loveliest passages in Rostand, Cyrano de Bergerac. You'd be surprised how efficacious those lines can be. I sure would. Here, here, I'll write it down for you. Now, I'm sure this will help you a great deal in your pursuit of the fair Harriet. You certainly have a beautiful handwriting, Mr. Boynton. Gosh, Harriet practically swoons every time you write the questions on the blackboard. Oh, that's very flattering, Walter. There you are. I sure appreciate this, Mr. Boynton. Gosh, after all the trouble you've gone to already, I hate to ask you, but... Well, if this works, will you be my best man? <laughs> I have sent for you, Miss Brooks, for two reasons. Yes, Mr. Conklin? First, I want you to pick up your allotment of report cards. You'll find them in one of those envelopes on the desk. Yes, sir. It's marked for Miss Brooks. Have you got it? Not yet. Let's see, here. Well, now, they're all alphabetically listed. Are you looking under B? But you said the envelope's marked for Miss Brooks. I've been looking under F. <laughs> <laughs> I found it, Mr. Conklin. Well, good for you. <laughs> Pick up your lifetime supply of lifesavers on the way out. <laughs> now, the second thing I want you to do is change my daughter Harriet's seat in your class. Why, what's wrong with her present location? She's right across the aisle from a case of walking arrested development called Walter Denton. <laughs> Their very proximity has fostered an infantile romance, culminating in Harriet's receiving a series of mushy, ridiculous poems. Oh, but Mr. Conklin, Walter didn't send Just those poems. Just move him away from my daughter or vice versa. But Mr. Conklin, the poems... That the only come... poem I'm interested in, Miss Brooks, goes, Yours not to reason why, yours but to do or die. <laughs> I believe in private enterprise myself. <laughs> Good day, Miss Brooks. But, Mr. Conklin... I have spoken. Yes, Master, I go. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. 
Regardless of age, skin type, or previous beauty care, doctors prove you too may win a lovelier complexion with palm olive soap. But to win this lovelier complexion, you must stop improper cleansing. Instead, use palm olive the way doctors advise. 36 doctors, leading skin specialists, advised using palm olive soap this way for 1,285 women with all types of skin. Young, old, dry, oily, normal. And using palm olive soap alone, two out of three won lovelier complexions. Oily skin looked less oily. Dull, drab skin wonderfully brighter. Coarse-looking skin appeared finer. Here's what the doctors advised. Wash your face with palm olive soap three times a day. Massage with palm olive's wonderful beauty lather for 60 seconds each time to get palm olive's full beautifying effect. Then rinse. Look for improvement within 14 days for doctors prove this way using palm olive alone really works. So get palm olive soap and start today to win a lovelier complexion. And ladies, enter the $100,000 49 Gold Rush Contest. The makers of palm olive soap offer $49,000 first prize and over 4,900 other prizes. Get entry blanks and complete rules from your dealer now. You may win a fortune in cash. When I left Mr. Conklin's office, I headed for my classroom again. Hello, Miss Brooks. Oh, hello, Harriet. Guess what? I just found another poem smuggled into my history book. And this one is the loveliest one of all, and the most important, too. Because I know who sent it. I know at last who my secret admirer has been. Look, Olivia. I mean, Harriet. <laughs> How do you know? By his handwriting. Every time I've seen it on the blackboard, I've practically swooned. But, Miss Brooks, he's... Well, he's a little older than I am, and... Do you think an older man could become infatuated with a woman my age? It's happened, but I'd think it over very carefully if I were you. The first man with whom I fell madly in love was a little older than I was, and because of the difference, our romance got nowhere. How old were you at the time? I was three, and he was 68. <laughs> I just knew it couldn't work out. I figured that by the time I'd come of age, he would have already went. <laughs> <laughs> You're just teasing me, Miss Brooks. But this is a serious matter. I've got to let him know I know who he is. How are you going to do that? In a very subtle manner, Miss Brooks. I'll just give him back his poem without saying a word, and then he'll know that I know. But, Harriet, your father doesn't admire your secret admirer. Oh, he will. I wish I had an envelope to put this note in, though. I don't want to lose it before I meet him. <sighs> Here. You can use this envelope, Harriet. Wait till I take out these report cards. There you are. Now, I'd better be getting into my room, Harriet. I've got to sort these cards before my next class. Very well, Miss Brooks. And Miss Brooks. Yes? Isn't love a wonderful feeling? <laughs> it's dandy. <laughs> Poor Miss Brooks. In love with the one who loves me. But that's life, I guess. The Eternal Triangle. Oh, good morning, Harriet. Have you seen Miss Brooks? Mr. Boynton! Oh, dear, Mr. Boynton. Here, Mr. Boynton. Au revoir, Mr. Boynton. Oh, but Harriet, Harriet, just a minute. What's this envelope? Poor Miss Brooks. Oh, I guess she wants me to give it to her. <laughs> Funny how kids act sometime. Come in. Busy, Miss Brooks? Why, no, Mr. Boynton. I was just sorting these cards. Well, I just dropped in to tell you how much I'm enjoying the book I borrowed. Of course, what with coaching the basketball team and all, I haven't finished it, but there are several passages in it that really remind me of my youth. <laughs> I was a romantic kid, all right. Them were the days. <laughs> now, now, in those days, I had a lot more, well, if you'll excuse the expression, intestinal fortitude. You mean concerning, if you'll excuse the expression, girls? <laughs> well, yes. You might not believe this, but I even wrote poetry. Isn't that silly? I don't think it's silly at all. You don't? Miss Brooks, if I were to... That is, if you were to... Yes, Mr. Boynton? What I mean is, in your honest opinion... Yes? How do you think the basketball team will make out tonight? <laughs> With you coaching them, they may back right out of the gym. <laughs> 
I've got to be running along, Miss Brooks. Maybe we can discuss Cyrano again at lunch. All right, Mr. Boynton, but I'm still a little amazed at your interest in such amorous literature. Well, maybe you've underestimated me, Miss Brooks. Underestimated you? Yes, I... Oh, oh, I almost forgot this envelope. It's for you. Well, so long, Miss Brooks. But, Mr. Boynton... Now, what is this all about? What's in here? Your name hangs in my heart like a bell's tongue, and evermore with love I tremble. And the bell swings, and then your name rings out, and everything you do lives in my heart. Why, Mr. Boynton, you underestimated dog, you. <laughs> Lunch period finally arrived, and I hurried into the cafeteria just as Mr. Boynton got there. This, of course, was pure coincidence. The same pure coincidence which has occurred every day for the past two years. <laughs> the student's threat to boycott this cafeteria last week seems to have done some good, doesn't it, Mr. Boynton? Oh, yes, indeed. They've even put flower pots around on the windowsills. Have you noticed them? Those? I thought those were jars of jello. <laughs> yeah, I'm crazy about flowers, Miss Brooks I've just ordered some from my biology lab They certainly do a lot to relieve the drabness of a schoolroom So do you I mean, uh... <laughs> Aren't flower pots a pretty expensive luxury for a teacher? Oh, they don't cost anything, anything at all, Miss Brooks Mr. Conklin gets them through the school nursery You just tell him how many you want He signs the requisition and that's all there is to it well, you ought to get a dozen or so for your room. My room? But it's so crowded. Where would I put them? On the windowsills. Oh, that's right. The pupils who sit there could hold them on their laps. <laughs> well, I suggest you request the small size pots, Miss Brooks. You'll be surprised how a few flowers will brighten things up. Frankly, when I was in your room this morning, it seemed rather cold. Cold? For a biologist, you're a pretty bad judge of temperature. <laughs> but if it's flower pots you want, it's flower pots you'll get. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'd like to get back to my room before my next class and make out the requisition. Well, certainly, Miss Brooks. But before I go, Mr. Boynton, this interest you have in flowers, does it extend to bees? Well, yes, bees fascinate me. Oh, then you know about the bees and the flowers. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's the first thing a biologist has to learn. But that was quite a while ago, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Mr. Boynton. Yes? Don't you think you could use a refresher course? <laughs> And so I would like a dozen small flower pots for my windowsill. Come in. It's me, Stretch Snodgrass. You gotta help me, Miss Brooks. I got a problem. A problem, Stretch? Yeah, it's about Harriet Conklin. No names, please. What's your problem, Stretch? As you know, Walter Denton is my best friend. And I know he's gone on Harriet Conklin, but I'm gone on her too. I realized as soon as I seen her that she was a real gone gal, Miss Brooks. And even though she's my best friend's girl, I can't help it. I'm gone on her. Thank you, Nellie Lutcher. <laughs> Even Mr. Boynton has noticed how it's affecting me. He coaches me in basketball, you know. And he said if I don't snap out of it, I won't get to play in the playoffs. Well, why don't you tell Harriet how you feel about her? I'm sure Mr. Conklin would welcome the change. I don't want to go with Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Besides, I can't talk at all hardly when I'm near Harriet. I get so scared, I can't open my mouth. Sounds like Mr. Boynton coaches you in something besides basketball. You don't understand, Miss Brooks. I wouldn't want Harriet to find out how I feel. I just want to worship her from afar. Believe me, Stretch, and I speak from experience. It's no fun from that distance. <laughs> you see, Miss Brooks, for quite a while now, I've been smuggling little notes to her every day without signing them. So you're the one. What one? The one who's been slipping Omar Khayyam into Harriet's eclairs. <laughs> That's right. But I lost the book somewhere, so I had to make up today's poem myself. That's why I came to you, Miss Brooks. I want you to hear it and tell me if it's okay. All right, Stretch, go ahead. <clears throat> to Harriet. Oh, I love the dear silver that ain't in your hair. <laughs> <laughs> and the brow that ain't furrowed or wrinkled with care. <laughs> I kiss the dear fingers not toil-worn for me. Oh, I love you, dear Harriet. Well, what's the next line? I couldn't think of another original one, so I just put down Mother McCree. <laughs> <laughs> well, Miss Brooks, what's your honest opinion? My honest opinion, Stretch, is that it's pretty abominable. No kidding? And it's the very first poem I ever wrote. <laughs> Amazing. 
I know poets who've written for years without getting that abominable. <laughs> Look, Stretch, if you want to make a hit with Harriet and get her mind off Walter, which will get Mr. Conklin's mind off me, you'll have to give her a different type of poem. What do you mean, Miss Brooks? Well, something like, uh, say, I've got one right here. There, it's all written out for you. Let's see. Your name hangs in my heart like a bell's tongue, and evermore with love I tremble. Miss Brooks... What's a bell's tongue? It's right in front of the bell's tonsils. <laughs> <laughs> and the bell swings, and then your name rings out. And everything you do lives in my heart. What do you think of it, Stretch? Keen. What I like about it, it's just the right size to fit into a Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go right to the cafeteria now. And... Oh, wait a minute, Stretch. I'd like you to do something for me first, if you don't mind. Oh, sure, Miss Brooks. What is it? Just take this requisition to Mr. Conklin's office, will you? Oh, sure, right away. No detours now. I want those flower pots as soon as possible. Okay, and thanks for the poem, Miss Brooks. Well, if it isn't Stretch Snodgrass. Uh, Harriet. Oh, gosh, Harriet, you're just the one I wanted to see. Harriet, even though you're Walter's girl, I mean, well, I can't help it. I've just got to tell you how I feel about you. Harriet, I think you're abominable. <laughs> what? I felt it right from the start. There's something I want you to have, Harriet. Here, take it. Hey, wait a second, Harriet. I'll walk you down to the... Oh, hiya, Stretch. <sighs> Hello, Walter. I-, I can't talk to you now. I gotta hurry and deliver a message to Mr. Conklin. So long, Harriet. Goodbye, everybody. What's the matter with him? Oh, I don't know. He seems awfully mixed up. He told me I was abominable, and then he gave me this note. A note? Well, what does it say? I don't quite understand it. It says, I would like a dozen small flower pots for my window sill. <laughs> Ask Miss Brooks to step into my office immediately, please. Now then, Stretch, you're positive Miss Brooks told you to give me this note? Yes, Mr. Conklin. I see. Well, that will be all, Stretch. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Conklin. Hmm. Your name hangs in my heart like a bell tongue. <laughs> and evermore with love I tremble. Now, really? <laughs> Come in. You sent for me, Mr. Conklin? Yes, Miss Brooks, I did. Uh, sit down, won't you? Thank you. Miss Brooks, I don't know quite how to begin. I, I received your note, of course, and, well, I never suspected you felt the way you do. Well, I did decide rather recently, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> but, uh, Miss Brooks, you know Mrs. Conklin so well. What do you suppose she'd say? Don't you think she'd like the idea? <laughs> <laughs> like the idea? Mr. Conklin, aren't you exaggerating the importance of my little note? It isn't as if I'm asking for the moon. All I want is some little ones. <laughs> little ones? Yes. I've got as much right to them as anybody else, haven't I? <laughs> Uh, but, Miss Brooks... If this... a dozen is too many, I'll settle for six. <laughs> and if you don't mind, I'd like to have them by the end of the day. <laughs> You've been working very hard lately. <laughs> and I know conditions here aren't too good. And conditions I would... aren't too good in any school, Mr. Conklin. That's one of the reasons I want them. <laughs> Let me review this request, Miss Brooks You say you want six little ones by the end of the day That's right I'd like to string them along my windowsill <laughs> String them along your windowsill? Well, that's better than letting them lie around the nursery, isn't it? <laughs> But why do you come to me? Because you supply the whole school. <laughs> Miss Brooks, what are you talking about? Flower pot. I want you to sign the requisition for me. Requisition? But I didn't get a requisition. Here's what Snodgrass brought me. Your name hangs in my heart like a bell's tongue. Oh, excuse me, Daddy, but there's been a terrible mistake. Eh? What are you talking about, Harriet? 
Why aren't you in class, Denton? It was Stretcher's mistake, Mr. Conklin. I guess I got excited. Oh, pardon me, but the door was open, Mr. Conklin. I Mr. Thought... Boynton, what is this, a convention? <laughs> well, I heard you were called up on the carpet, Miss Brooks, so I thought I'd come by and see if there was anything I could do. Oh, that was very sweet of you, Mr. Boynton. It's about the poem that was What's in What's a... going on here? What's all this poem nonsense, anyway? Well, don't you see, Daddy? Stretch gave you the poem he was planning to give me by mistake. But he wasn't the only one that gave Harriet a poem. I did, too. I put one in her history book. What? But it wasn't my idea, Mr. Conklin. Then whose idea was it? Do they take women in the Foreign Legion? <laughs> Steve Arden, as our Miss Brooks, returns in just a moment. But first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Lester Cream girl. Tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a Luster Cream shampoo. Only Luster Cream brings you K. Dumas' magic formula blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Gives loveliness lather even in hardest water. Glamorizes your hair as you wash it. Luster Cream, not a soap, not a liquid, but a dainty cream shampoo. Leaves hair fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Gives new beauty to all hairdos or permanents. Four-ounce jar, one dollar. Smaller sizes, either tubes or jars. Tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo and be a dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream Girl. You owe your crowning glory to a Luster Cream Shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Harriet was so impressed by Walter's efforts to woo her away from her secret admirer that she forgot about Mr. Boynton and Stretch before you could say, your name hangs in my heart like a tongue in Barney's delicatessen. <laughs> As for Stretch, he, of course, was heartbroken, but out of his soul-shaking anguish came another great original composition, which he cleverly entitled, Melancholy Baby. I had a date with Mr. Boynton that night, and while I was waiting for him to pick me up, Mrs. Davis and I were chatting in the living room. Well, Connie, do you think that his reading Cyrano will change Mr. Boynton's bashful attitude any? I hope so, Mrs. Davis. He certainly has been backward when it comes to... I'll get it. Hello? Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. This is Mr. Boynton. I just wanted to let you know I've certainly had my eyes open by this book you loaned me. You mean Cyrano, Mr. Boynton? Yes, it's wonderful, Miss Brooks, and it's made me realize something I should have known long ago. What's that, Mr. Boynton? I don't read half enough. So if you don't mind, Miss Brooks, I'd like to call off our date tonight and stay home and finish the book. <laughs> Mr. Boynton. Yes? May I suggest another book for you to read? What book is that, Miss Brooks? It's called Everything Comes to Him Who Waits. But, brother, you're waiting too long. <laughs> Next week, tune in to another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Palmolive Soap, Your Beauty Hope, and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, written and directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Here's good shaving news. Three men out of every four can get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves with Palmolive Brushless Shaving Cream. This is not just a claim... Here's the proof. 1,297 men tried the palm olive brushless way to shave described on the tube. And no matter how they shaved before, three men out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Try palm olive brushless yourself. See if you don't get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves the proved palm olive brushless way. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North. The exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evenings over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at this same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. Stay tuned now for Life with Luigi, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.